Uh -huh. I don't know. I'm being asked to admit people for some reason. Don't worry. We'll take care of all the admitting. Okay. I don't know why, <laughs> I don't know why I'm getting that. Yeah. Uh, you're a co-host. Because you're a co-host. Oh, I'm a co-host. Oh, well. So welcome everyone who's coming in. We'll start in just one minute. So I think everyone in the waiting room is in. Just want to say good evening to all of you. I'm Mark Kligman, the director of the Lowell Milken Center for Music of American Jewish Experience. And it's our pleasure to welcome you to this wonderful program tonight to look at the film, The Song Searchers, in this very timely period of what's happening daily and right now in the Ukraine. And we're so glad that we have the opportunity to see the film and have with us a number of individuals who made the film possible and people who are in the film. Once again, I'm Mark Kligman, and we're very grateful that we can make this program possible as a part of our UCLA Lowell Milken Center for Music of American Jewish Experience. We uh, invite you, we'll put a link to our website to attend many of our other wonderful programs. We have other um, uh, uh, programs happening both live and online uh, next week and in the weeks to come and we hope that uh, you can join us. First off, I'd like to mention that we are aware that the Russian oligarch Roman Abramovich is a main contributor to this film, Song Searchers. As has been reported, Abramovich is a close associate of Vladimir Putin. We acknowledge the problematic source of Abramovich's wealth. At the same time, his philanthropy has made cultural projects possible. The war in Ukraine by Russia creates a conflict we see the value in this film and the importance of showing this film and engaging in our discussion to educate and inform people of the value of Jewish music in Ukraine and the importance of Moshe Beragovsky. For our panel tonight, we have several individuals and I'll introduce them now and then they'll appear in this order. The first will be uh, Victorina Petrosans, who's the executive producer of the film. Unfortunately, Elena Yakovich, the director is un unfortunately not able to be with us. After Victorina, we will have Igor Kolistinsky, who's the principal violin of the Orchestra del Maggio and Musical Fiorentino uh, uh, Fo, who is, uh, appears in the film. Following him will be Mark Slobin, Emeritus Professor of Western University, well-known scholar working on Eastern European and American Jewish music. And that will be followed by Eleanor Bezinski, or we'll say Dr. Eleanor, who recently got her doctorate, who's an archivist at YIVO. So we'll welcome all our guests. And again, we'll appear in that order. And first, we'll welcome Victorina Petrosans. Victorina. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Uh, first of all, I would like to say thank you to everyone who showed interest to our movie. For us, it was a mission to tell the story about Moshe Berigovsky, who saved for us Jewish folk music through his archives, through these little pieces of papers which he wrote. We can see now life of Jewish shtetls, lives of thousands of Jewish people. Four years ago, I met Anna Sternschitz, the professor of Toronto University, who told me a story about her amazing project, Yiddish Glory. The Yiddish Glory project was nominated for the Grammy Award. And it was the beginning of our journey. We organized an expedition to the Ukraine and follow the steps of Moshe Beregovsky, we tried to collect the stories of, um, which were told by the witness and filmed the places where the stories uh, took place. It was a very emotional and difficult trip. And especially now, uh, the war is going on there and this footage feels more dramatic. And again, in the world history, we see how fragile peace and how fragile the human life. We filmed in Italy, in Austria, in Lithuania, in Russia, in Israel, in the United States, and we have, an huge material, we have amazing material of Jewish heritage. 
And we feel like we have to continue this journey. We have to continue work on this uh, subject about, you know, we, we would like to make a movie about the Klezmer music, about the people we met during this expedition. And I feel like we all want to listen to stories which Igor Polisetsky, who, who, who has a part in our movie and who was a partner and uh, soulmates in this project. And I think we all have to listen. It will be very interesting to listen to Igor Polisetsky. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, uh, for me, the... Uh, the most important, uh, probably the, one of the most important things I've done in uh, uh, in my professional life. Um, uh, I, uh, I'm both um, the classical uh, violist, violinist uh, uh, all my life, and I was playing Jewish music since I was six years old in Kiev. I'm from Kiev, and uh, I had a connection with. Berigovsky and Berigovsky's family, who is also from Kiev. Uh, I heard about him since my childhood. So happened that uh, we had friends in common, family friends. I met his uh, uh, daughter and his granddaughter, and that's through them that uh, through the uh, Elena, the granddaughter, that uh, that um, uh, the makers of this. Uh, film came to speak to me in Florence. And when I found out about uh, the plan of going to Ukraine uh, and uh, filming the places where Berigovsky was collecting this uh, uh, his material, one of these places uh, is Kaliniendorf um, um, in the southern steppes. Um, it's between Kherson and Nikolaev, Kherson and Mikolaev in Ukraine, in Ukrainian. Uh, this is the, uh, those plains, uh, the steppes, uh, absolutely incredible places, if you see them, uh, in the southern part of Ukraine, where now uh, um, the war is raging. That's where main battles are, are happening. Uh, and those were the places where the Jewish colonies were established um, by the um, uh, Tsar Alexander the uh, First, and first Jews came to uh, work the land there in uh, nine, in eighteen oh eight, and that's where my family came there uh, and became Jewish farmers, and that's where Moshe Berigovsky collected a lot of music uh, that we know was played in my grandparents' family. It's in those places that uh, uh, that um, uh, the family got was killed on 16th of September of uh, 1941, so most of them are there. Uh, that's if you saw the film, that's where we had a possibility uh, to be there, and that's uh, for me was extremely emotional experience uh, to be there and to play. Uh, this music. Uh, there I played uh, something that was played in, uh, in, in their wedding, the Zygizund from Berigovsky's collection. And uh, I must say that um, uh, I had a number of discussions with um, um, people connected with Jewish music about the, the movie. And the one question was, um, this movie seemed to be more about the um, uh, Holocaust. Uh, it was so much, um, uh, so much connected with the very recent history, um, and um, uh, it spoke less about the uh, great significance of Berigovsky, his scientific work. Uh, Mark, of course, uh, uh, brought it out, but we we talk about him as a collector, but not about him as a as a great ethno pioneering ethnomusicologist. Uh, but I, as a musician, uh, that uh, practically dedicate my uh, my life um, to interpreting, finding the key to interpretation of this material of the uh, of this Yiddish mu uh, instrumental music that Berigovsky uh, collected, I find that uh, it's very very important to know uh, the history. Um, 
uh, I find that this film uh, says uh, a huge amount about the tragic history of um, of Ukrainian Jews and uh, life of Birigovsky as an example of this history. And uh, I find it absolutely pertinent, uh, very important to have that side for the people that play and interpret uh, the Birigovsky material, because uh, I don't think that you can play um, this material just as a, a normal, happy um, dance or wedding music, uh, knowing what was happening in Ukraine, what is happening in Ukraine now, what was happening in Ukraine during the Second World War. And I must say what was happening there all throughout uh, our very complex, very uh, happy and very desperate uh, history of Jews of Ukraine and our living with um, on 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 that land for for centuries and centuries, and um, another thing is uh, that that um, I want to emphasize uh, is the incredible connection with Ukrainian people that we have, and uh, what must be emphasized that work of Birigovsky would be impossible without his connection with one of the great, great Ukrainian ethnomusicologists, also pioneering Ukrainian ethnomusicologist, Clement Kvitka, uh, who was his professor, he was his mentor, as mentor of many uh, great Ukrainian ethnomusicologists, uh, and um, a lot of research and the depth of the Berigovsky's research in uh, Jewish folk music uh, was possible because of the Kvitka's research in and uh, depth of his research in Ukrainian folk music. And as a student, a uh, music student in Kyiv Conservatory and in Kyiv uh, Musical College, I had uh, firsthand experience with uh, um, research in um, Ukrainian Ukrainian ethnomusicology, all connected with work of uh, Kvitka and Filaret Kolesa. Uh, so, in that sense, what is happening now uh, is uh, uh, very tragic, of course, but very important example how these two people that lived in the same land, uh, how our music and our lives somehow interconnect. So it's um, uh, it's been incredibly painful for me this last uh, uh, last uh, last weeks. I, I hardly can think of music, but um, it's uh, thinking about uh, this film and uh, uh, what happened and uh, uh, looking at all of that. It it brings everything into the focus. So I I will be very happy to to take any questions that people will have later on, but that's, I feel extremely personally connected with this, uh, with this music. It's connected with my family, as, as, as I mentioned, as you could see in the film, um, and practically all my work with my group in Florence, Glismerata Fiorentina, is connected with interpretation of Berigovsky's heritage, with uh, bringing out this, uh, this emotional connection. Uh, so we've been playing that all over the world and uh, in the kind of big stages. And I find that this music is much more than uh, just a uh, folk music, but it's a, a kind of a spiritual and uh, emotional, um, um, has incredible and in that significance. Uh, it's it's like a an essence of the, uh, Jewish soul of Ukrainian Jewry. And that's how, how I see it. And uh, I hope uh, to, um, uh, to work on bringing that idea more into the uh, klezmer world uh, uh, of today. So that's basically what I, I, I hope that I didn't speak too much. Thank you, um, Igor. That was wonderful. We really appreciate your personal you. uh, account. Um, could you maybe just share with us how people can get access to your music? Is there a website? Or yes, a yes. It's uh, 
uh, website is klesmeratafiorentina.com, Klesmerata Fiorentina. All right, so I'll put the link in the chat for everyone. Yes, so, and um, uh, it's also in the YouTube, if you put Igor Polosetsky in the YouTube, practically only klezmer music. I also had uh, people were taking a lot of my um, uh, talks about the history of Ukrainian Jews, uh, history of music in Odessa. Uh, there are all kinds of uh, all kinds of uh, interviews that uh, that in in the, in the process I, I I've done or over my uh, my activity. So you could find a lot on YouTube if you put Igor Polsky. Wonderful. Yeah, I'll put, I'll put that I'll put that link in. Yes, so thank my, you so my, much, Igor. My, and, YouTube channel. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank, you. Yes, thank you. Thank you. I'm sure people have questions for you. For yes, those of you I, I um, would, would be like very... to see in the chat, there's a, some nice discussion going on, which we'll get to about the uh, cylinders of these recordings and the status of them now. So now we're going to turn things over to Professor Mark Sloven, who's done a lot of work on this material for a number of decades. And uh, Mark Sloven, we're so glad you're with us. Oh, you're muted, Mark. Sorry, sorry. Uh, thanks, Mark. It, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here, and I have to thank Igor for his uh, remarks. Uh, I'm going to mention Kritka, too. Uh, um, it, that, was, that was very helpful. Um, I'll mostly read what, I, what I've written. Uh, I'm trying to give a lot of background uh, to Piotrgowski here. <clears throat> Uh, discussing this groundbreaking, absorbing, and intensely human film has become a very different story since I first saw it and responded to it, you know, like last year, uh, as Ukraine has descended into tragic violence once again. Uh, we, we really see this film through different eyes. I should just say this moment has particular personal resonance for me. Uh, my mother was a refugee from Ukraine exactly 100 years ago. Uh, following the path uh, to Kishinev that's now being uh, heavily traveled once more by uh, escapees. Not, of course, not so many Jews uh, this time, but uh, this is a familiar story to me. Um, given the age-old uh, tangled and perilous history that has brought us today, uh, uh, particularly the story of the three million Jews who lived in Ukraine uh, in the early 20th century, Bieregowski presents just one brief moment that can offer a microcosm of the paradoxes of this place. Our hero, and, and he is that, arrived on the scene in 1926. Um, this was a moment when the, mass, the memory of the massive pogroms of 1919 to 1921 was still an open wound, uh, barely bandaged by the Soviet attempt to restore order in Ukraine. Jeffrey Weidlinger has written a, a very fine new study um, about the pogroms uh, of this period, uh, and he confirms the death toll of at least 100,000 Jews. Some people think up to 200,000 Jews in those pogroms, which are the, uh, the engine that propelled uh, my family out of the area. Uh, so that's, that's, he's arriving when that's just still fresh. And then in 1932, even as Biergowski was collecting folk music, Stalin's vicious famine was in progress. 80,000 Ukrainians died of starvation in 1932 in just the Kiev area alone. Soon to follow, in only another five years, uh, were Stalin's massive purges, uh, deportations, and his increasingly strident anti-Semitism, um, which then, after a very short time, gave way to the massive uh, destruction caused by Hitler's invasion. Uh, of the Soviet Union in 1941. Um, so as Berygovsky's working, all these horrors were tsunamis about to break over the Ukraine and Berygovsky's attempt to survey Ukrainian Jewish music culture. The Ukrainians, uh, it must be said, um, after this period that he was doing this work, would no longer play a role in supporting Jewish culture, to put it mildly. Against all odds, in his heyday as a working scholar, we see Piotrgovsky housed and supported in a Jewish division of the Ukrainian Academy of Sciences, a temporarily protected space for the systematic gathering and contemplation of the deeply rooted Ukrainian Jewish cultural heritage. Uh, the metaphor that came to me as I was writing this out of nowhere was that Piotrgovsky functioned something like a fish in a winter lake carrying on an active life by finding enough nutrients to survive under a thick layer of ice. 
That's what fish do in a lake in the winter. He was able to come up for air briefly. Uh, in the wartime, he was evacuated to what's now called Bashkir Tostan, uh, where he managed to keep at work studying the local folk music uh, of the Bashkir people. Um, so this was a kind of breather. And then again, as poignantly and, and abundantly testified to in the film, in the brief thaw uh, of this lake, uh, immediately at the end of World War II, he felt he had to go out and document the Holocaust ravaged remnants of Jewish communities in very difficult circumstances. For I can't even imagine how he did any work at all. Um, alas, the weather changed again, and then he was sent to the Gulag, which he kind of barely survived and died a somewhat broken man by all accounts. Piotrkowski's legacy remained in doubt for decades after his death in 1961. Most of us thought his archive probably did not survive the deadly duo of the KGB and the Gestapo. To our surprise, the 1990s brought the news that the precious materials had in, indeed endured, though we outsiders had no access to what was now Ukrainian state property until recently and extremely partially. To jump to the present crisis, um, to answer the questions in the chat, I, I watched this webinar and there was a member of the uh, Jewish division of Yunatsky Library just the other day saying that yes, the materials um, so far are safe and he wouldn't talk about what they're doing with them and where they're putting them because he doesn't want to you know, say anything about it. But he, he said they were uh, being uh, taken care of. So the brief period of our recognition and limited exposure of these precious holdings over the last 30 years has become just another moment in a string of pauses for breath before uh, history uh, has forced the record of Ukrainian Jewish music beneath the surface again. These radical shifts in the political and military and cultural atmosphere of Ukraine and Russia make it very hard to assess Biergovsky's work. I'm, I'm going to turn to this just a little. Beyond recognizing the massive achievement of his stockpiling of valuable evidence for the diversity and richness of the Ukrainian Jewish musical experience. Decades ago, I brought up the issue of how seriously, for example, to take his pro-Stalinist rhetoric. Was it subterfuge or was it co-optation? That remains an open question. There's also um, discussion lately about the selectivity of his collecting efforts. Um, he, he only collected certain kinds of things. Um, he downplayed most religious-based music, which might have to do with the work, the, the moment he was working, um, despite his fine anthology of Hasidic Nigunim, which was quite a surprise to all of us. Um, he also tended to scant the music dance connection. Um, he backgrounded some repertoires that were outside the core that he was uh, mostly interested in. And he's, you know, he posited some historical relationships that now look a little bit questionable. Um, Zeb Feldman has pointed all this out recently um, in his appreciation, but also analysis of Bierkowski's work. Yet I prefer to focus on the breadth of his vision and the largely inclusive nature, nature of his work, including, say, those Nigunim and the substantial sampling of Purimspiel folk plays, which is completely unprecedented in, in folk drama. This openness um, extended to his vision of folklore itself, leading to a flexible, shifting, multi-sourced methodological standpoint, influenced by that brief period of open inquiry of the 1920s by those who influenced him, like the Ukrainian scholar Clement Kvitko that Igor has mentioned. I always like to compare Bierigovsky to that other great figure of early 20th century folk collecting and publication, Bela Bartok, the composer, who did massive work collecting and analyzing folk music, not far away from where Birigovsky was. Bartok, however, was not much concerned with the intense interactivity of ethnic traditions and practices. That allowed his work to lay the cornerstone for nationalist traditions of collecting and analysis among the peoples of the Hungarian kingdom that he worked with, Romanians, Slovaks, and so forth. Some of those um, attitudes spilled over to the creative work and the polemics of the widening circle of Jewish composers, scholars, and collectors in the early 20th century, um, who were uh, looking for an unchanging, inherently Jewish music that perhaps dated back to biblical times. 
By contrast, here's what Bierogowski had to say as he began working, already in 1930. So I'd like to quote the guy's words. Is it possible to speak of, quote, Jewish music when it has been created by different classes, strata, and groups across a wide geographic spread among differing economic, social, and cultural circumstances, and as a minority in a diverse, quote, national musical, unquote, environment? Turning from generality to the specifics of his research method, he says, can there be a general unified musical language, or can one find just identical musical expressions, intonations, turns, rhythms, and so forth. This analysis of what he was looking for uh, and how he thought about we, the ways we should understand the local Jewish music are really driving the current work, um, which is very energized and very lively today, uh, of people analyzing and, and um, performing Yiddish land um, music today. Um, this this kind of uh, methodological openness and um, interest in the in the diversity and, and broad um, attitude about what is Jewish music anyway. So what we inherit from Bierdegowski, so finely portrayed in the film Song Searcher, should be a gentle open-mindedness, a big ears combined with a big heart that respects and safeguards the colorful and hard-won aesthetic freedom of the Ukrainian Jews and their kin across Yiddish land. I am grateful to the filmmakers for giving a broad audience a deeply respectful and humane introduction to a great and still largely unknown figure in modern Jewish cultural history. Thanks. Thank you, Mark. That's a, a wonderful portrayal of uh, Moshe Berdovsky and some terrific information. We now have a wonderful presentation by Eleanor Bezinski, who, I, as I mentioned earlier, is an archivist and academic. She's also an active performer as well. So I wanted to mention that as well. So um, after Eleanor, we'll be happy to take some of your questions. So Eleanor. Hi, thank you so much. And thank you all for what you just talked about. It was really uh, very interesting to listen to both Victoria and Mark and Victorina. Thank you. So. <clears throat> What I want to talk about here is the is the renewed interest and the creativity that has happened around the Berigovsky collections in the in the recent years, uh, and especially over the 2020 pandemic. So um, the 20 the the pandemic has changed the way archives function, and the demand for digitized material has become stronger and stronger. Furthermore, musicians from around the world interested in Jewish music suddenly found themselves stranded at home and depriving of touring, they had an opportunity to bring to the forefront some activities that they hadn't been able to prioritize until then, including the study of the older sources of plasma music and in particular the work of Moshe Berigovsky. New collaborative projects were a, later, a late ripple effect of the Jewish musical revival in, Rus in Russia from the early 20th century into the present. A few remarkable initiatives took place over Zoom, started in April 2020. First, um, so I'm gonna share my screen to, to show you some of the websites, uh, some of the, and I can share some links uh, later as well, but, uh, First, um, so in April 2020, um, the violinist uh, Craig Uderman, stranded by European confinements while touring with his partner, the singer Sasha Lourier, in Scotland at the home of Michael Alpert, uh, who is, I think, here, um, uh, who is a leading uh, military instrumentalist, a NIH fellow, and translator of Berigovsky. Um, so, Craig wanted to open up the conversation that they were having to the community of those who might be interested and able to contribute. So he created this Facebook group that he named Berigovsky Online Forum and organized a series of uh, Zoom roundtables um, uh, on the repertoire collected and studied by Berigovsky and his reissues with experts. The art Archives of these roundtables are uh, hosted on the website of the Klezmer Institute, 
an organization created in 2018 by Christina Crowder, Clara Bayom, and Zev Feldman, aimed at the study, the preservation and dissemination of Ashkenazi expressive culture. So here, uh, the Bergowski Online Forum number one, Bergowski Online Forum uh, number two. And so the, the archives are, are here on the website. And uh, so there were some very interesting um, conversation. And I wanted to point out uh, in particular that there is a Bergowski bibliography and discography, which is in progress, but uh, quite uh, important here on this page. And uh, the second, uh, there were there were two of them, and and um, with very um, interesting discussions on the, the sources and and how the material is used. In parallel of of this, <laughs> London-based violinist Ilana Kravitz, author of among other things a klezmer violin manual, launched an international project involving thirty-five violinists to explore revisit, record, and share pieces from an unpublished volume of Berigovsky Nigunim, the wor some wordless melodies. In addition to this, each participant um, was scheduled in a series of daily Zoom concerts called a Niguna Day. So here, if you go on this page, uh, you, can, you can see uh, each artist and a link to their an Egan a Day uh, performance. And also um, uh, the, the archive of, uh, of the, the Niguni that they recorded uh, individually on, on YouTube on the, on, the la on the right of this page. Um, so the Egan a Day was broadcast. I don't have a dog, so whoever has a dog, <laughs> maybe can mute. <laughs> Um, uh, so the, the uh, Niguna Day was broadcast live on Facebook and archived on YouTube. Um, and I also participated in this, but the really amazing uh, thing about this project is that Ilana uh, was in possession of the scans of the unpublished material that she uh, uh, was not authorized to just share around. So what she did instead is uh, distributed just a few uh, a few paid a few uh, tunes to each of these musicians so that they record it and it's it's like a um um a, a, the, a, a ripple effect too like a an archive was created on this archive so that the tunes become accessible not in the form of manuscript but in the form of uh their interpretation uh as uh recordings so, and this project that Ilana started prompted the accordionist Ilya Schneves to, um, I'm sorry, uh, to um, create a Google spreadsheet that he humorously titled Berigovsky and the City, that will maybe show, yes, um, to collectively cross reference the sources of the pieces collected by Moshe Berigovsky, whether they are published in print whether they are part of uh, Berigovsky manuscript or as sound recordings, both historical and contemporary. So this spreadsheet aimed at, um, aimed at uh, gathering uh, the sources mat material and cross-referencing it if they appear at different places. So members of the community contributed to this initiative, including the librarian and researcher Daniel Kochner um, from Vancouver, uh, who is the author of numerous Wikipedia entries on klezmer figures and also creator of a YouTube channel, Classic Klezmer, very uh, great resource of historical klezmer recordings. And then uh, inspired by these initiatives, I also um, I started a reading group in Yiddish Leyenkreis, motivated by simply the desire to read together with others uh, Moshe Bergowski's uh, Yiddish article, Yiddish Klezmer, they are schaffen und stege. The, um, so, um, yeah, I just posted on the Facebook page that Craig Udelman had created, who wants to read this with me. And after suggesting this idea, I was immediately joined by a group of enthusiasts, um, including uh, David Zakalik, uh, 
a biologist, uh, uh, but most importantly, a musician, passionate klezmer, composer, and Yiddish translator who volunteered to host the, the Zoom meetings, as well as um, to type up our collective translation as we went along. And Uri Schreter, a doctoral student in musicology at Harvard, who took the initiative of keeping a journal of our discussions, tentatively uh, titled Glossary, including those uh, on particular terms, I mean, the discussions on particular terms or themes addressed by Berigovsky that had sparked our conversation within the group. The collegial nature of these virtual encounters has attracted and retained over the month a group that include, included both some of the greatest specialists on, uh, in klezmer and Jewish music, as well as passionate amateurs whose presence may have been motivated solely by curiosity, and all contributed their knowledge to the group's discussion, which shed light on the text that brought us together. The nearly 30 Sunday sessions in 2020, during which we completed the reading of this first article, never saw fewer than 12 or 15 participants, and by early 2021, the group was hovering between 20 and 25 weekly participants um, from all over the world, uh, almost, <laughs> but from many different countries. Um, an English translation by Michael Alpert of the Russian version of this article was published in Kurt Berling's uh, reprint of Berigovsky's book, Jewish Instrumental Folk Music, in 2015. And, um, um, and in parallel, the conversation about those sources uh, and the different, different versions of the pieces, the circulation of the pieces from one tradition to another, and uh, remained very animated for all those months in a private Facebook chat uh, that was called Reading Berigovsky in Yiddish. So there was like several, uh, several paths of communication and it was really chirping <laughs> during those months around the work of Berigovsky. There was a lot of activity. Um, and uh, of course, very important, um, I have an issue, I can see very well now. Yes, here. Uh, very important was the kickoff of the Kisselgoff Makonovetsky um, digital manuscript project um, of the Klezmer Institute, a crowdsourced project born around the online publication of the manuscripts of the Kisselgoff Makonovetsky collection, which are original notebooks of the Ansky expedition found um, in the National Vernadsky Library. It's an international digital humanities project to make these materials. Um, uh, available for researchers, instrumentalists, and singers around the world to engage with it firsthand. The project seeks to use modern digital humanities tools to transcribe and translate the music and notes contained in approximately, sorry, approximately 850 high resolution scans from handwritten notebooks and catalog into digital formats for further study and performance. As Christina Crowder, uh, the leader of this project, posted on the project's Facebook page uh, today, uh, as of Tuesday, as of this Tuesday, 983 tunes have been digitally notated from these notebooks, which is 70% of the total. I think around half of them were digitized by a single person uh, named Hannah Ochner, which is a very uh, amazing uh, musician from Germany and the rest uh, by a large group of passionate uh, musicians and scholars. Online events, like the Big Digit that was organized uh, last weekend um, by um, the Klezmer Institute, help also advance the project with, um, so the Big Digit is like a 12 hour long program with people meeting around a different topic, uh, composing new works, um, uh, about certain uh, highlight on certain people uh, from whom um, Kisselgoff has collected um, or play along sessions, uh, focus on a certain heft, uh, focus on translation, etc. So these these um, series of meetings are like a hub of research on this material too. Um, the um, 
This project was also brought, um, oh, sorry, in addition to the digitally notated tunes from the manuscript, other resources have been created from this collected data, such as a cartographic representation uh, of the provenance of the pieces by Gabriel Zuckerberg, and um, also a visual glossary compiled by Daniel Kackner. Um, this, um, and now also the, the, there is a YouTube playlist of um, compiling videos produced by musicians from the digital material in the collection. So you can see how multifaceted this project is and, and the engagement with uh, the, the collection that Berigowski inherited from his predecessors. Um, so, and this project was also brought to Yiddish Summer Weimar uh, with a series of, of lectures, workshops, play-alongs, and performances. And you can also find um, all of this online, uh, the digital lecture series that explains the project uh, in length. And, um, and uh, this is a, a play-along session of material from the collection, so you can hear the music that was uh, that was rediscovered just in the in the recent month, and the last uh, last uh, project that I wanted to mention is the collaboration between uh, violinist um, Alicia Sfigas and Jonathan Malin, a musicologist at the University of Colorado Boulder. Uh, they uh, had the the opportunity to to. Um, to, uh, part to participate in this uh, creative residency created by the late and regretted David Schneer called Archives Transformed that was created to allow artists and scholars to work together on archival based artistic projects. So uh, yeah, this uh, I will end there, but I just uh, want to uh, really um, insist on, on this, how these projects are open and non-hierarchical. And these are projects that combine uh, deep scholarship exploration, scholarly exploration of the material and musical creativity. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eleanor. And you really helped provide us a very important perspective of the legacy of Moshe Berigovsky and how the work that he did is now being mined and these group sourcing projects to a younger, more present generation to make this material relevant is so important. So before we go on to Q&A, we just wanted to tell everyone that the film to, to see the film, uh, we're gonna put a link into the chat where you can see the link on your own and that link is available for the next three days. So this event is not seeing the film, it's talking about the film, but we wanted to make the film available. So it has, been, uh, it has been available for the last few days. It's still available and we invite you uh, to view it after this program or whenever it suits you. And um, as you can see, the link, which is now in the chat is there. I just wanted to quickly mention before we go into Q&A, Eleanor, you mentioned such um, an incredible amount of material and activities. Is there a link you can provide to us or a guide as to how to uh, access some of this material? I will post a few links now. Okay, and thank you. I mean, I just want to just add that those, this material I was mentioning was cataloged by Berigowski. So I didn't show the Berigowski catalog, but uh, this is sort of what helps uh, comprehend the whole, so. Great, thank you so much. So. With that, we thank you to all of our, our thanks to all of our panelists. And uh, we'd like to um, invite anyone who's here. I know there are people here with a lot of experience uh, and have great interest in this topic to ask your questions, engage with us in dialogue. Feel free to use the raise your hand function or uh, post your question in the chat. And we're happy to hear what uh, questions that you have. So does anyone have a question? So one of the um, chats that have come in um, 
I suppose a number of you can answer this question, is how much of the material is vocal? Yeah, sure. Uh, Birgowski, um intended a, a five-volume publication of, of uh, from materials he collected. Uh, and uh, the first volume was actually published in the Soviet Union, and it was all folk songs. Uh, then he had a second volume, uh, which was supposed to be um, the second volume of folk songs, which uh, was was not published, and the volume of the Klezmer tunes, and the Nigunim, and the um, Passover uh, Purim spiel folk dramas. The other four volumes were, were never published, and um, manuscripts, uh, they remained only in manuscript, and then they were microfilmed in various ways um, and, and distributed kind of um, sub rosa and uh, in a clandestine way uh, through the 1990s and into the uh, in, into the uh, the last years, uh, it circulated and then got more circulated widely. And, and some of that material has been now um, actually published in in various places in various formats. Um, most of them not I mean not really in serious scholarly critical editions as you'd like to have for those volumes. But the bulk of his work really was songs. Um, and um, so uh, we have been uh, taking account of that. There's something called YiddishFolksong.com, which I should also mention. If you go to YiddishFolksong.com, a group of us who are specialists in, in, in that area um, um, have created a site for uh, analysis and reflection um, uh, about the Yiddish uh, folk song itself. Uh, as opposed to all the kind of activity that Eleanor has been talking about, which is about the instrumental music. Uh, and if you go to YiddishFolksong.com, there is uh, an increasing set of links and resources uh, for uh, understanding the, the, uh, the mostly the, the old traditional, um, so to speak, um, the, the older styles of the unaccompanied Yiddish song. Uh, with the long, with uh, very serious bibliographies of things you can read about the about the Yiddish folk song, so yeah, um, we should not scant the uh, the vocal music side of his uh, collecting. So thank you, uh, thank you, Mark. Um, our dear friend uh, Cantor Neil Schwartz is asking um, if there are links to some of the subsequent publications. I think maybe Eleanor had um, shared with us a bibliography, so I point everyone to the chat where Eleanor has really put in some wonderful links, which is very valuable information about how to listen to some of the music and where to get additional information. Um, so some of the other questions that have come in that uh, we'd love any of our panelists to look at is, what is the process of current Klezmer bands to gain access and for, for, to perform this music? Um, Eleanor, I mean, People just Sorry, they've been circulating I these tunes for forty years in in various kinds of versions and playing them literally. I came out with the edition, the first edition of Birgowski in English in nineteen eighty two. So it's the fortieth anniversary of that, and um, it rapidly spread through that entire community. So that edition that, that I put out, which is um, some of the some of the klezmer tunes and some of the songs, um, was this kickoff, and then um, then. With, uh, with Michael Alpert and Robert Rothstein and Zali Zimczowski, uh, we um, did the uh, volume of the, uh, of the Klezmer music, or what we call Klezmer music, which is, of course, a, a non sequitur of the traditional instrumental tunes. And then Michael has continued that work uh, in, in, and uh, Kurt Bierling in subsequent editions. Um, so um, that, there we go. There, there's the latest version of Jewish instrumental folk music that Michael's holding up. Um, which uh, the latest edition of that with uh, some of his writing in it. So it's it's been a it, it's been literally forty years that people have had access to some of this, and then in increasing quantities um, over time. And you know, when people have tunes, they just take them and play them. They're not copyrighted. <laughs> yeah. So um, Michael Alpert, who's collaborated. Oh, I'm sorry. Before we call on Michael Igor, I'm sorry. Yeah, if I if I can uh, save just just uh, uh, my little bit uh, on that, um, uh, it's fantastic. So many people are participating in uh, uh, in playing uh, in playing this uh, this materials. Um, uh, I happen to be um, uh, from different tradition because most of the most of the musicians that um, that are playing this uh, this materials and that 
the biggest problem for me is uh, kind of one-sided um, uh, approach that uh, not one-sided, but uh, it, it all came from one source, uh, basically, uh, the all the Klezmer Renaissance from uh, from the American interpretation of the uh, of the Klezmer music, and then from there. Uh, the the interpretation of the Berigovsky uh, Berigovsky tunes. Um, it's uh, what what I personally, as a, as a Jewish musician from from Ukraine, um, who did not I did not come from any kind of uh, uh, recordings, or I, it, it was kind of a direct uh, direct connection to whatever. Um, uh, tradition, life tradition that we had, um, uh, I must say that the biggest problem that I personally see is not uh, the material that uh, the, the tunes, the amount of tunes are getting more and more and more. It's the way these tunes are perceived and the way these tunes are played, um, uh, the, the, the way they are spoken. And uh, I find them uh, uh the it's 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 fantastic to see the variety of um uh, of, of um, people and uh, love for this uh, for this music people getting together and playing but um i personally find that it's uh, we had a very very old and very professional uh, uh, music instrumental tradition, uh, especially violin tradition. And um, it's, it's just not, uh, it's not deep enough what is happening. Uh, and I would love to have uh, more people uh, looking at the depth of this material, uh, of the intonation of this material, what what they would, uh, the Russian musicologists would call intonacia, which makes any tune Yiddish. It's how to speak Yiddish on a violin or on an instrument. And uh, that is something that I would love to have uh, more of the attention rather than uh, the huge amount of musical material that is now beginning, more and more beginning av available. That's that's my, um, uh, you know, Berigovsky um, uh, once uh, performed, and this was an anecdotal thing, but it was true, it was told to me by his daughter. Uh, he at his uh, dissertation, uh, when he was uh, doing his dissertation for uh, in Moscow during the war, he, he did his uh, his doctorate on klezmer instrumental music, and uh, there was discussion about the um, uh, written material and why he didn't put more of the um, specified uh, uh, notes and how the performance is. So what he did uh, as a uh, he he's saying to the uh, panel um, without saying anything. He's saying them the very famous uh, Russian dance tune, uh, Kamarinskaya, in such a way that nobody uh, it sounded absolutely like a, like a Zmiris, uh, like like a Jewish uh, a Jewish tune, and uh, um, people did not realize that it was a um, uh, the tune, the Russian Russian dance, simple Russian folk dance that uh, that everybody knew. So they even got upset with him, but he did it to prove that it's the way. It's the way the uh, the kind of a kavana, the, uh, the uh, intention uh, of the musician um, and the uh, intonation that that one uh, performs this tune. That what makes the uh, the, the that what speaks uh, truly. Uh, so it's um, the the a kind of uh, work that is being done now with uh, with availability more and more availability of the musical material which is fantastic it is wonderful uh, i find that um, 
the depth of interpretation or variety of interpretation is more more connected with uh, uh, kind of imitative uh, listening to uh, perhaps some recordings and uh, and trying to imitate that rather than understanding the inner musical um, uh, essence uh, of this material and it that what I would hope that would be uh, uh, discussed among the musicians, and I hope to start that discussion now. Igor, thank you so, so much for, uh, for, for sharing that with us. For many who are here may already know that there are wonderful programs through Close Canada, Yiddish New York, where people can mm -hmm. learn this material. I really alert, um, just call to everyone's attention in the chat, there's really wonderful um, materials and resources and comments. And if Michael Alpert or Christina Crowder would like to just talk about the wonderful work that you're doing or that you've done, uh, we'd love to give you that opportunity. So, uh, Michael, did you want to continue with the discussion? Yeah, actually, I was going to um, just add to what's been said before the um, a, a quick note on what Eleanor said. Um, when I was uh, translating and editing the initial uh, edition and it's basically still it's all still there in the uh, of the Klezmer volume it's all still there and what uh, Kurt Burling and I have have re-edited um, Kurt made significant re-edits to uh, the musical transcriptions and uh, and copious notes on them as well um, that in terms of the uh, my translation of the text it wasn't only from the Russian I actually um, compared very closely the Yiddish version of that text as well, the one that Eleanor spoke about um, that we were reading in the, uh, the reading group that started uh, early on in the pandemic. And um, so if there were differences between the Yiddish text and the, and the Russian text, I certainly noted them, um, particularly in regard to um, names of instruments, instrumentation, um, terms that I thought would be uh, appropriate that were there in Yiddish. Um, I also wanted to say that uh, there's certainly been um, mention of the uh, the archive at the Vernadsky Library in Cave. The, um, although the recordings um, se seemingly can't be ordered uh, at this point, and I think that was that seems to have been true, uh, at least recently, um, before the the beginning of the war and the Russian invasion. Um, the materials are uh, in um, in those recordings uh, is up online. I'm not sure currently what the status of them is. I actually have been meaning to go take a look, and um, if if somebody else here uh, maybe. Christina or or Mark or Eleanor want to tell us um, is that yeah, is that website still functioning? And um, Christina just chimed in and said yes. Ah, uh, okay, yeah, that's what that's uh, that's what I was hoping. Um, I also want to just mention here too, since I have, have uh, several colleagues here today. Um, early on, very early on, um, after the invasion, the uh, the scholarly community and the community of of, of the archival community um, has sent. Uh, there, there was stuff going around about um, the possibility of digitizing and uh, you know, taking already digitized materials and, and keeping them uh, elsewhere uh, other in, in addition to in Ukraine. Um, not, not at, so I was wondering if, um, if anyone has, maybe Christina or you might be the best person to talk about it. Um, if you're, you know, on that, and if there's been any possibility to do that with this material, the um, last thing I'll say is just in response to Igor, um, I think that uh, it's. I'm not sure quite what you've been listening to um, from this coming out of the the international closer community, which is global at this point. But the um, as Mark mentioned. Um, Many of us have been playing this the material in Bidigovsky um, for 40 years or more at this point. And uh, the, in addition, um, a lot of us, uh, there's a, uh, a crew of us in within those circles. And uh, uh, Eleonore is certainly someone like this, although someone, uh, a younger part of the community. Uh, Christina, I know as well. Many of us have, were 
even from the beginnings, um, and I'll say that as someone who's basically considered a progenitor of this, one of the progenitors of the, the entire Klezmer Renaissance right. that you referred to, which I think might have been my term as a matter of fact, but the, um, the, many of us were focused on the older European recordings of the music um, as much, if not more so than um, the recordings that were made uh, in the United States starting in the 19 teens when the uh, the recording industry that was based in in Russia and Austria-Hungary shifted to the the U.S. because of World War One. So um, I, I would uh, say, as Christina did in the chat, that um, many of us are very deeply engaged with the Yiddish intonacia, with the, um, the intonation of klezmer music, and have been um, uh, studying it, researching it, uh, and performing it. Um, I, I think with increasing uh, depth and authenticity for many years now. So, uh, Pintale. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Michael. I'm glad you could join us. Uh, Christina, you're such an active and wonderful uh, contributor to the chats. Would, is there anything you would like to say? Yes, um, thanks, Mark. Um, thanks very much. And thanks to Eleanor and Mark Slobin and to Mesh for chiming in here and for everybody who's here and for this wonderful movie. Um, the thing that I wanted to add is that I, I understand the that point about uh, quantity, right? That that quantity is not uh, synonymous with quality. But what I have found to be um, really um, a joy in the work that we've been engaged on over the last two years is that this rediscovery of the handwritten manuscripts of musicians from the Anski expeditions and Maknevetsky's work has allowed a new generation of musicians and musician scholars to have the joy of uh, discovery, that they're getting to see something and experience something for the first time. And, and, and that's, uh, I think, really powerful for us, like who learned from people like Meish, uh, who got to work with the culture bearers. Right. And and I didn't ever get to meet Bronya Sakina, but I know about her through Michael. And so for us, like this idea that we get to meet um, characters like, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, Makinovetsky and uh, Reider and these other characters that we get to see inside of these manuscripts um, gives us, excuse me, the um, the joy of discovery like we get to meet these characters for the first time and that's really i think that's part of what's brought this huge community together we had 175 people come to our first digitizathon event and last weekend we had probably 100 people who came during this marathon session to to nerd out about translation and to sight read tunes and to talk about uh, the long form pieces of Pedutzer that are sort of scattered across the manuscripts. So um, I just think it's an opportunity for a new generation to engage deeply with the material and deeply with the work. And, and particularly at a moment when we couldn't play in person together because of the COVID and the crisis of that, um, this was a way for people to connect about this um deeply felt and very passionate music and for that we're like deeply grateful it's the silverest of silver linings to come out of the the covid uh crisis the global covid crisis is that um the Berigovsky online forum happened and that reading the lane craze happened and all of these wonderful ways to connect um people from russia with people in germany and in Ukraine and Belarus and from the West Coast and the East Coast, we're all able to connect together on Zoom. So, um, yeah, that's what I'd just like to add. And, and thanks for the opportunity to share that. Thank you, Christine. And the work that, that you uh, are doing and spearheading uh, is really, really extraordinary. So, um, Eleanor, I know say, you have your hand uh, up. Mark, we'll go to you one second. So, okay. Eleanor. Uh, yes, I, I just wanted to to add uh, to what uh, Christina and Meishke said about the, the engagement. Like in the in the reading group, what was really uh, incredible was that we were reading Berigovsky in Yiddish. Um, talk so and 
talking about things that were sometimes hard for us to understand what he was actually talking about because of this distance. But there was the, all this conversation happening and there was, so the group was intergenerational, international, and non-hierarchical. I want to really insist on this. It was really amazing how our mentors and, you know, the mentors and the mentees were all in the same room talking about this, these topics and um, everyone had something to bring, whether it was a language skill or someone who knew Baroque music, someone who knew, uh, you know, how to read a, and in the KMDMP project as well, in those rooms that I was mentioning in the DG, big DG uh, events, someone who knows how to read a, a specific German hand, right, handwriting uh, or a specific, so all of these knowledge, they, they come together and no one, no one knows it all. It's the, the coming together that makes it so powerful. And also the other thing I want to say is within those collections, we're actually discovering the notebooks um, and the repertoires of those professional violinists. And that was kind of a missing piece for a lot of people. And I agree on that with Igor, that maybe there was not such great awareness of this. Uh, I mean, yes, in the for some, yes, there was, but like in the general audience, not a, a great awareness of the of the professionalism of the Kesmorim. And so this is actually really, uh, bringing some new light on this, and people are excited about that. Uh, these are compl complex pieces that we're discovering, not just, uh, uh, you know, eight bars uh, Freilers, which are beautiful too, but, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's really a, a great, great discovery. So just want to add that. Thank you, Eleanor. Uh, Mark Slovin. Yeah, I, I think it's always important to think uh, you were raising issues that have to do with the peculiar nature and the extremely poignant nature of the Jewish uh, case within European folk music systems. Um, I was in Bucharest in 1974, okay, where this is, there were Jewish populations still playing their music there. Um, <clears throat> and in the archive of the, of the Folk Institute, um, somebody just came back from field work and everybody gathered around to look at what they found in the field work they did in a Romanian village. And what those guys did was, they went back to the villages where Bartok had collected 60 years earlier, 70 years earlier. And they would look, they would, every year they'd go back until the last kid that he had recorded died. And, and they would say, oh, look, Maria changed her cadence. Okay. And I was just sitting there saying, if we could do this with Yiddish shtetls, you know, if we could do this with Jewish cities, if we could go back and talk to those people and, and the people that were there when Ansky recorded and the people there when Beardagoski recorded, I mean, we would be in a, like a totally different position understanding the intonatia, uh, you know, of this music, as Igor points out. Um, the, the tragedy is that we, we unlike all the other Europeans, um, we cannot do this. You know, there's absolutely no way. We, it's what I usually call crumbs from the banquet, you know, that we have. We're getting off this table, you know, and trying to piece together what the chava looked like. I mean, uh, this, is, um, this is our problem. So um, the fact that, that 100 years later, after Pierre Gofsky starts doing this work, that we are that interested in it and that dedicated to it is some kind of a miracle of cultural uh, endurance and, and cultural transmission, despite the most extreme forms of, of um, dislocation and disappearance of, uh, of everything that, uh, that, that came out of, of the communities themselves. So uh, to me, um, I'm, I'm very excited by the fact that this is in, 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 you know, going on in, in the ways that it's going on, but you know, it's within the most extreme circumstances. When we did the Lane Cries that Eleanor, Eleanor talked about, where every week we got together and, and we're reading this text of Bierigovsky's and translating it uh, line by line, I said, oh, I get it. Bierigovsky has become the Torah and, and we're doing a weekly Parsha and we're holding, you know, like drush sessions about what does it say in, in, in the Holy Writ? I mean, but that's the, that's where Bierigovsky ends up. I mean, if there had been six other Bierigovskys out there, you know, and, 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 you know, that much more material out there, we wouldn't be here today talking about, and this film wouldn't have been made. It is the unique shining exemplar of what might have been, basically, Bierigovsky. And so it, it actually, you know, does remain a kind of secular, um, sacred text. 
Thank you so much, Mark. So our last comment by uh, Michael Meshka Alpert. One second. Uh, hi. Uh, yeah, I actually didn't mean to uh, have the last comment here, or, and it hopefully in Jewish style, it won't be the last word. It'll be the the, uh, the last word before the last word. The um, what I wanted to uh, suggest is, um, and it's certainly been in the chat, but uh, if people are interested in um, seeing some of this current scholarship in action and just and scholarship and just discussion of all of this. Um, if you're on Facebook, there's the Berogovsky online forum, the uh, which is called that, and uh, the uh, Klezmer Institute, of, and particularly the Kisel, Kiselhoff Makalevitsky uh, Digital Manuscript Project also has a Facebook page. And that's a great way to kind of keep up with these events as well as um, see and possibly participate in some of the discussion that's going on um, about this. Because a, a lot of, you know, as um, as Eleanor for, certainly mentioned here and, and others, um, this uh, it's very much kind of uh, participatory, um, non-hierarchical scholarship that's, that's going on and discussion of all of this. And so um, it's it's a place to uh, it's where a lot of this is happening. Not uh, not only in uh, books published by August University Presses and so forth. Uh, those those sources are important too. But um, so yeah, if you're interested, um, come get involved with this stuff that's there. Thank you so much. And perhaps if anyone would like to email us at the uh, Lowell Milken Center at UCLA, uh, we can give you a copy of this chat which will have all these wonderful, wonderful links for you um, to take advantage of. So my thanks to all of you for joining us today. Particular thanks to Victorina uh, Petrasan, who is, was the executive producer of the wonderful film that uh, is the anchor to this entire discussion, to uh, Igor Holetsky, to Mark Slobin, to Eleanor Wazinski, and to our guests who um, all uh, contributed we thank you greatly. And we just wanna say once again, that <clears throat> if you signed up for this event, you have a link to be able to watch this film, which we encourage everyone to watch the film. It's very moving, very important, and really brings to life um, the experience of the people to um, uh, learn about from family and scholars about Moshe Berogovsky. And of course, as you've seen now, there's just a plethora of scholarship performers and just avid interest in this. We'd like to thank Natalie um, Azarov, who's uh, an important uh, producer and person involved with the Song Searcher film. And we thank you for all your help in organizing today's panel. And at the Lowell Milken Center, our Associate Director to Dr. Lori Black and to Beth Kramer, uh, thank you for all your help, things that we see, things that we don't see behind the scenes. We're very grateful to everyone's help. So thank you so much for joining us and hope you um, are able to watch the film. And of course, our thoughts are uh, with the people of Ukraine and uh, this war that's going on. And we uh, are able, glad we were able to really talk about the Jewish music experience. And let's just hope that peace will come soon.